We're not supposed to watch the local broadcast channel. At least that's what my neighbor Donna says. I hide the remote. You can't be too careful with kids in the house, you know. She said as she leaned against the fence post. You hide the remote so your kids can't turn on the local channel, I repeated. Yep, and it works wonderfully. I only moved in here a few weeks ago. So far, everybody was friendly and nice. But Donna seemed a little cuckoo. A housewide ban on watching the local TV station. Really? I mean, I get it if she were talking about some adult program or something, but local broadcasting channels don't usually air that stuff, do they? Um, why don't you want them watching the channel? I asked. She blinked and then she laughed, throwing her head back. Oh, that's a good one. I'll catch you later. Uh, Rebecca, right? Okay. She squeezed my wrist, smiled, and then headed off down the sidewalk. I stood there dumbfounded. A few days later, I went over to another neighbor's house for some tea. Melinda Patel, the woman in the blue colonial on the corner. After we had talked for a while, I decided to mention it. Do you know Donna? I ventured. Melinda nodded, taking a sip of tea. Oh yes, we go way back. Both original owners. I glanced around and then I lowered my voice. Don't you think she's a little um, crazy with the whole TV thing? Oh yeah, definitely. I breathed out a sigh of relief. It's absolutely insane that she even keeps a TV. With the two little kids, it's too risky. Yeah, I know she says that she hides the remotes, but you know how kids are. They find everything. She shook her head. It's insane. I stared at her at a loss for words. When my kids were that age, I said no, no siree, not taking that risk. She took a sip of tea. It gave me so much peace of mind. What exactly is on the channel? I asked with a small laugh. True crime? Something worse? Her eyes locked on mine. Oh, don't joke about it, please. She kept staring at me with such an intense look that I fell into silence. I changed the subject to her flower garden and her peppy personality snapped right back. And then there was Jerry. Around 4pm she swung by her house an hour after I had returned from Melinda's. Just wanted to see how y'all are settling in, she said, giving us a big smile. Oh yeah, we're good. She came in all smiles and chit chat. But when her eyes fell on our big screen TV mounted over the fireplace, she froze. Oh, you have a TV? Yes, we do. Well, okay, she said, I and our five-year-old son playing in the corner. She lowered her voice. And did you tell them not to? No, okay, let me show you. You can actually program the TV so it can't go to channel 13. A neat little hack that I learned the first few weeks here. Oh, that's okay, I said. We don't need it. Suddenly realization swept over her face. Oh, y'all don't have cable, a good idea. You can get so much with streaming services and all. We've got cable, but we're sure to disconnect it at night. Oh, that's smart, I said, finally catching the gist. So the kids won't sneak down and watch it while you're sleeping, huh? Oh no, we don't got any kids. But you know, we don't want to end up like Jeremy, waking up in the middle of the night to his TV on. She shook her head. So awful. What happened to him? She glanced to my son again. Not in front of him, she whispered. And then it was back to small talk and soon after she laughed. So weird, I said to my husband, Ben. Why is everybody so weird about the local broadcast channel? He shrugged. I don't know. I mean, they can't be broadcasting something so awful, right? Aren't there laws about that? He nodded. Maybe it's some sort of bizarre prank that they're playing on us. Like hazing. Or maybe it's a psychological experiment. He laughed. 
did we unknowingly move into a neighborhood of social psychologists? I don't know, but it's really weird. And after our son Nathan fell asleep, I found Ben sitting in front of the TV, turning the remote over in his hands. I'm thinking about turning it on, he said. Turning to channel 13, he nodded. I'm going to bed, I said crossing my arms, and I think that you should join me. And Ben broke into a grin. I knew it, you're scared. Well listen, you go on upstairs and hide under the blankets and I'll be up in five minutes. Okay, fine. I plopped down on the sofa next to him. I'll watch it with you, you win. He grinned. The TV flickered on, casting eerie blue light on the walls. I watched as his thumb pressed the numbers. One, three. And then it was on. A man appeared on the screen, sitting at a desk. He was relatively attractive, but his hair was slicked back with too much grease, and his makeup was caked on. And his teeth were white, too white. Like that Ross in that episode of Friends. You, Ben said. Yeah, well, local broadcast channels don't have much budget. Still, couldn't they do better than this? He looks like a mannequin and a used car salesman had a baby. Oh my gosh, I said laughing. What, it's true, even his hair looks fake. He said, gesturing. Probably a toupee. He's too young to be bald. Maybe a wig then. Okay, okay, shh, let's hear what he's saying. The weather is going to be cool. The newscaster said, and gesturing into a poorly CGI'd map of the town behind him. I have 50s and low 40s, and now let's get back to the local news. The map disappeared and he sat down. Our first news item is about local woman Melinda Patel. A small photo of her appeared above his shoulder. Ooh, ooh, I slapped Ben's arm. That's the woman that I had tea with this afternoon. Really? Yeah, she told me she did some work on the school board, but I didn't think she would be on the news. Last week, Melinda Patel passed a motion to have discounted school lunches for everyone. The newscaster continued. No doubt the fact that she's screwing the principal played a role in the decision. Ben and I froze. Um, what did he just say? I said. He's sad as she's screwing the principal. He can't say that on TV. Well, now we know why the kids aren't allowed to watch. Ben said, starting to giggle. I stared at the strange mannequin man with dread sinking in. He smiled back, eyes blankly staring ahead as he read off the teleprompter. Then Jerry Johnson, the local librarian, drunk herself to sleep after a phone call from her son. Wait, I thought that Jerry said she didn't have kids. He shrugged. Hey, maybe she lied. Maybe this guy is making it up. For all we know, this guy is just spewing garbage to get people to watch. The smile faded from the newscaster's face. He inclined his head slightly, blue eyes locked on the camera. Let's move on to new resident, Ben Hernandez. My blood ran cold. He just can't keep his froggy little mouth shut, now can he? The newscaster said in a lilting tone. He has to compare me to a mannequin so that his wife thinks he's funny. His blue eyes stared at us from the screen. Empty and hollow, mouth curled into a small smile. How does he know that? I whispered. Ben glanced at me fearfully and then grabbed the remote and quickly pressed the power button. The TV didn't turn off. Let's, let's get out of here. He grabbed my hand and we both stood up, backing out of the room. But I couldn't look away. Couldn't look away as his blue eyes followed us as we moved away from the TV. Just before we got out of view, he smiled. We ran into Nathan's room. Ben dragged a chair over, wedging it underneath the doorknob, and then we both stood there paralyzed, staring at the door as if we expected the newscaster to crawl out of the TV and break in at any second. I could still hear his voice loud and clear drifting up to us. 
Today, Susan Thompson asked her husband Bill for the 54th time to fix the stove. Later that night, she used the search term, Can Police Trace Cyanide? Margaret Liu took a pregnancy test today. It's positive. How is she going to tell her boyfriend? It's not his. In other news, a beautiful Labrador puppy was adopted by Leanna Dobbs. Hopefully, she can afford to feed it with her crippling 17346 in credit card debt. We need to get out of here, Ben whispered. They probably have bugs in every room, every house in this neighborhood. Oh, suddenly I felt relief at this real-world explanation. Do you think our house is bugged? I mean, yeah, how else would that guy be able to hear and see us? Yeah, I guess that's the only way. Ben bent over Nathan. Hey, buddy, we're going for a drive, okay? He hoisted Nathan up and the three of us started towards the door. And then I stopped. It's quiet, I whispered. And good, so the TV finally went off. But we didn't turn it off. We tried to earlier, maybe it just turned off now, he sighed. Come on, this kid is heavy, open the door. Reluctantly, I dragged the chair away. My hand fell on the doorknob and then I pulled it open. I poked my head out and the hallway was empty. I stepped into the darkness and we crept forward. Eerie blue light flickered across the stairs. The TV's still on, I whispered. Okay, so maybe the volume went off or something. Ben's voice grew hurried and more nervous. Come on, let's just get out, okay? The car keys are next to the door. Dread filled me. Don't go downstairs. That's what every gut instinct was telling me. I couldn't face those horrible hollow blue eyes and that knowing smile. But then Ben started forward and I couldn't let him and Nathan go first. I darted in front of them. As I descended, the scene came into view. The TV was on, the newscaster sat at his desk silently. I would have thought that it were a photo if not for his index finger slowly tapping on the wood. And then he started speaking again, as if he had been waiting for us to return. What else can we say about the Hernandez family? He asked, slowly canting his head. Oh yes, they have a little boy who loves Minecraft and Paw Patrol. Nathan William Hernandez. A happy accident for a couple that vowed to remain childless. He paused and I swear it looked like his eyes were directly on Ben's. Or was it? I looked at Ben. Go, he said grabbing my hand. We hurried down the front porch steps, Nathan bouncing on his father's back. They dove into the back as I got into the driver's seat. The engine revved underneath us. As I pulled out of the driveway, I glanced up at the house. The eerie blue light of the TV flickered through the blinds. Where are we going? I asked, finally breaking the silence. Hotel. There's one on Main Street. We'll be safe there. I tore down the street, my fingers sweaty against the wheel. I rolled through the stop sign at the end turned to left and then screeched to a stop. There is a figure standing in the road. Melinda. Stop! Stop the car! She yelled, waving her arms. Ben rolled down his window. I know what you did, she whispered. You watched the channel, didn't you? I saw the TV on when I drove by your house. I was just about to come over there. We're going to the hotel, he said, glancing at me. No, you won't be safe at a hotel. They have TVs all over the place. Cables hooked up everywhere. She shook her head, dark hair falling around her face. Come on inside, you'll be safe with me. Ben looked at me and I hesitated but then nodded. We pulled into her driveway. As soon as we came to a stop, she ran over to the doors. Hurry, get inside, she said waving us on and then she shut the door behind us. Only then did I notice how many locks she had on her door. Two deadbolts, a padlock, a chain. She locked each one in quick succession, the metal clinking loudly. Mommy? Nathan asked, finally fully awake. Why are we home? Shh, 
baby, it's okay. I said stooping to his level. I squeezed his hands. We just... Mommy and Daddy made a mistake and we can't go home for a little while. He can sleep in my daughter's room, Melinda offered. She's away at college. But Nathan was already running towards her cat, a small orange tabby sitting in the corner of the kitchen. Lowering my voice, I turned to her. Why didn't you tell us? I asked you what was on the channel. I would have. Donna's supposed to debrief all the newcomers, but she didn't, did she? I shook my head. Dang it, she said under her breath, and then she turned back to me. I'm so sorry I should have realized you didn't know, but some people, they choose to make light of the whole thing, you know, because it's too horrible to face otherwise. And do you know who bugged our house? Was it the newscaster? Ben said. Melinda looked at him confused. It's not bugs. At least I've never found any in my house. Believe me, I've looked. He knows things real time, like minutes after they've happened. Melinda's eyes met mine. I know. The silence pressed in on us. My head was swirling with questions. Happy accident, or was it? His voice echoed in my head over and over and that horrible face was burned into my mind like an afterimage. I saw it every time I closed my eyes. Those blue eyes. Wait, where's Nathan? Ben asked. I jolted from my thoughts. I glanced around the kitchen and a horrible sinking feeling formed in my stomach. The cat and Nathan were gone. Nathan, Nathan, where did you go? I called. And then I saw it. The flickering blue light spilling out of the living room. Nathan, I screamed. I ran towards it, my heart beginning to pound. Nathan, don't turn on the TV. Don't you dare. I stumbled into the room. The TV was on, but the newscaster was gone. Only his empty chair, the wooden desk, and the blinding blue background filled the screen. Nathan? No. The room was empty, and the back door was hanging wide open. I leapt across the room and burst out the back door. Nathan, I shouted into the darkness. Nathan! He couldn't have gone far, he was only gone for a few minutes, Ben said behind me. All it takes is a few minutes. Motion caught my eye. I looked down to see the orange tabby cat poking around the side of the house. It meowed plaintively, and I ran towards them, around the side of the house. And then I saw Nathan. He stood there in the front yard perfectly still, staring into the street as if hypnotized. And there, parked by the curb, was a dented white van, complete with antenna and other broadcast equipment on the roof, peeling navy letters that read, Channel 13. Nathan, I yelled. Nathan, don't. He slowly turned around. He found the green truck I left at the park. He said simply, Can we go get it, Mommy? I grabbed his arm and pulled him back. He does not have your truck. He's lying to you. And I told you not to talk to strangers. The van's engine rumbled to life. Slowly, the van pulled away. I watched, staring at the man's silhouette in the driver's seat. I pulled him back inside, and then I wrapped my arms around him sobbing, as Ben and Melinda locked the house back up. The orange cat brushed against us, nuzzling his face against Nathan. For a while, I wasn't even coherent, just holding my son so thankful that he was still here, and not in the newscaster's car. What would have happened if he went? Would I have ever seen him again? I didn't want to think about it. I sat on the floor in Melinda's daughter's room. We had put Nathan to sleep an hour ago. He didn't seem too disturbed by everything that happened. He seemed to calm even, laughing at how Melina's daughter had decorated her room head to toe with Hello Kitty paraphernalia. I was thankful for that. We could explain to him tomorrow how serious it was, how we had almost lost him. 
The soft footsteps sounded in the hall, and then the door creaked open and Ben emerged. Can we talk? He whispered. Nathan stirred. I got up and went out of the room and shut the door behind me, and then I sat on the floor and he sat next to me. A heavy silence fell over us. I could feel the question lingering in the air, but I didn't have the courage to ask it. That would only make it more real. Ben spoke first. We should talk. I turned to him and he was staring straight ahead not meeting my eyes. Yeah, we should, I whispered. What did the newscaster mean? Not a happy accident. Are you not happy or was it not an accident? He looked up, his eyes finally meeting mine. It wasn't an accident. What do you mean it wasn't an accident? Well, I wanted a kid, so I tampered with the condom, but what does it matter now? He stuttered. You love Nathan, don't you? Of course I love Nathan, I said, my voice trembling. So you, you should be happy it happened. I balked. What? I mean, you love him, and if I hadn't done it, then Nathan wouldn't. Yeah, you're right, I am happy it happened because I love Nathan, and I can't even imagine a world without him. My eyes met his. But that doesn't change the fact that you betrayed me. Rebecca, I'm sorry. And then it happened. My phone lay on the floor. The screen blinked on, and there it was, Channel 13 broadcasting to my phone. No, I whispered. I grabbed the phone and pressed the power button, once, twice, and then held it down, but nothing happened. Wait, where is he? This time the newscaster wasn't at his desk. He was somewhere dark and the camera was zoomed way up on his face so it filled the screen. A bright light shone across his features. His makeup looked even more fake, his hair even more greasy. And then he spoke. Here we are live at an active crime scene. My heart plummeted. Active crime scene, what? The camera began to zoom out and then in the darkness I could make out shapes. Boxes on the ground, clothes hanging in rows. And a familiar shape, a little stuffed animal right above his shoulder. A Hello Kitty. I leapt up, grabbed the bedroom door and yanked it open. Relief flooded me as I saw Nathan's little silhouette on the bed is still fast asleep. Get him, I yelled to Ben. He hoisted him up and we ran out just as the closet door began to swing open. He's in here, I screamed to Melinda. He's inside the house. She darted out of the kitchen and grabbed her car keys. The four of us ran out the front door, piled into the car, and as we pulled out of the driveway, motion caught my eye. Every window in the house was lit with an eerie, flickering blue light. The silence pressed in as we flew down the road. Melinda finally broke it. We'll be safe as long as we're out of town. As soon as we're out of the channel's radius, he can't get us, I know that much. I held Nathan tight against me. Ben glanced at her skeptically. If that's true, why haven't you moved away? I don't know. You convince yourself you'll be careful that you'll be safe. It's like all those times you see a murder on TV and you say to yourself, if that were me, I would have gotten away. When Jeremy, when his body was found, that should have been my warning. But I told myself that it wouldn't happen to me. That I wasn't careless like he was. So the newscaster killed him. Melinda glanced at me in the rearview mirror. No, his wife did. Poisoned him after the newscaster told her about his affair. Twenty some odd years ago. Melinda turned onto the highway and we flew down the road, approaching the city limits. We moved away after that, so did Melinda. She decided it was too risky to remain there, no matter how careful she was with the cable. Ben and I separated for a few weeks, but were trying to work through things. I don't know if I can ever trust him again after what he did, but we're going to try, for Nathan's sake. Most of the neighbors I met, though, were still there. 
Donna, of course, but strangely, most of the others too. Ben and I visited several months later to try to warn some of them. Like Jerry, but she assured me that she was perfectly happy where she was. Oh, I love it here. I love the neighbors, the houses, the whole place. And have you seen the local broadcast channel? She grinned broadly. It's incredible. Y'all should watch it with me sometime. <laughs>